welcome to Talent Hub Talk. I am Ben Duncan, and this is a place where prominent and inspirational figures from both the local ANZ and global Salesforce Ohana share their stories. In today's episode, I'm excited to be joined by Jody Herbeck, a vastly experienced Salesforce professional and the author of a new book called Rock Your Role as a Salesforce Admin. Jody shares her Salesforce career journey, how she got into this space and the roles she has held. We discuss how the role of a Salesforce administrator has changed over the years, look at the emergence of the platform manager and product owner roles, and cover how companies can work out the skills and experience they need from their Salesforce administrator. Jody is passionate about helping Salesforce administrators over-deliver without overwhelm. So she shares some tips for success when starting in a new role or business, explains the Salesforce administrator conundrum, and talks through the value that people will get from her book. If you aren't already following Jody on LinkedIn, I recommend that you do. She shares some great content there. And we'll also add a link to the book in the show notes so you can find out more information about the Rock Your Role as a Salesforce Admin book. I hope you enjoy the episode. Jody, thank you very much for joining us. Hey, Ben. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm so thrilled to have this conversation with you today. I'm very excited. We've spoken before off camera, and I know there's going to be a lot of knowledge and, uh, and wisdom shared in this chat. So, uh, yeah, really excited to hear more about your story and, um, and your experience over the years, because as we'll touch on very shortly, you have been in the ecosystem for a while now. Um, just, just to set the scene a little bit for anyone that maybe doesn't know you or doesn't know your background, um, what, what did you do before Salesforce? How did you find your way into Salesforce? And, and tell me a bit about what you've done since you've been working with the platform. Sure, sure. So so I'll set the stage right off the bat and say, I have literally been doing Salesforce for a living in some way, shape, or form for 20 years now. It surprises myself even to say that. Um, So without a doubt, the bulk of my career has really been in the ecosystem um, at some side of the table. Um, But like many people, I started in a sales career. I thought that I was going to sell. I was a sales trainer. Um, I, my very first job out of college, I sold um, Disney cable programming um, and then went on to sell websites back in the day when we actually had to convince people, what is this website thing and why do you <laughs> need one if you already have a yellow page ad? I know I'm dating myself here. Um, but in that role, I actually used a very early version of Salesforce, um, had an opportunity uh, soon thereafter to, um, in, a, in a services engagement I was doing with a very small company to, to help them implement Salesforce. Um, and keeping in mind, it was certainly not an enterprise platform. It wasn't even a CRM, right? At the time, it was really a replacement for um, products that some people might remember, Act, Goldmine, really tools that we were using in the sales space to share a Rolodex and collaborate so we didn't all have to roll up Excel spreadsheets once a week, once a month, once a quarter, whatever that was. That's really the genesis of how it started. With that, I found myself somewhere around 2002 inside a company that literally was created overnight. There were about 1,800 people that had spun out of the ashes of Arthur Anderson, um, for folks who might remember when when that firm was around, when there used to be the big five instead of the big four consulting companies. And long story short, um, they literally were, you know, kind of created this organization, didn't have any infrastructure, really didn't have any sales organization even. They'd really never had to have a proactive sales team and brought me in to help develop sales culture, sales training. Um, And ultimately, it became very soon um, apparent that we needed a tool to manage. We had, you know, global offices. We had offices all over the United States to ensure that we were going to market in a way um, that was leveraging the national brand, not stepping on each other's toes. Um, so I had used this thing called startup or excuse me, called Salesforce. And, uh, what I was going to say is they weren't quite a startup, but they were pretty darn close still. Right. Um, so I actually, you know, remember making the case to my boss that they weren't just two guys in a garage and it was okay if we let them hold our data. Um, and you know, just a, a few other things I think it's fun to share to, you know, to, to explain really how simple the tool was back then. Um, you know, certainly no record types, no 
dashboards even. I remember at some point dashboards came out. I pulled an all-nighter because we were having a big sales meeting that night and I, or the next day, and I really wanted to you know, be able to show these things off. Um, you know, certainly no sandbox. Everything was done in production. Um, and one that you know, surprises a lot of people, we literally didn't even have an OR statement in our report filters. So I remember going to the very first Dreamforce and sitting down with a product manager and explaining why we needed that. Because at the time, if you wanted to report on this or that, you literally handed somebody two different reports. No way. Um, so, so we've come a very long way, needless to say, um, from, from those early days. But um, even with you know, the kind of the, the simpleness of the tool at the time, it was very powerful um, that somebody like me that was not a technologist was able to lead and, and implement this to be so impactful inside our organization. Um, and it, it scratched the right itch, as they say, um, and in fact was so successful that um, we also needed a way to manage our recruiting efforts. And so we actually stood up a second org. And, you know, nowadays, you know, everybody does this, right? If you've taken your cert, you've seen, you've seen questions about this on, you know, the admin exam. But in 2003, 2004, this was a pretty interesting use case for the Salesforce platform and um, actually resulted in a number of requests for me to go demo it to the up-and-coming recruiting team at Salesforce. Um, and ultimately, they ended up recruiting me as well as the very first admin that I had. Um, I hired and trained him right out of college who helped me build it. Um, so that was when I made my transition from my first client site engagement. I'd been there for three or four years, um, led that, went to Salesforce for four years and spent time both as an account executive and a customer success manager working with very large enterprise accounts. Um, and ultimately, you know, everybody loves working for the mothership. Obviously, very different experience back then than now when it's so large. Um, but what I found is I missed hands-on keyboards and owning an org and doing the work. Um, so I, I hung out my shingle for some number of years as a freelance consultant, um, expecting to work primarily with big enterprises. Oh, and I should have also mentioned, at the time, 300, we had 300 customers when we did that deployment. We were a really big account for Salesforce. Right. I mean, now that's jump change. Uh, but we were actually one of the first companies to go onto the enterprise edition, which they had just launched. So, uh, you know, I, I take everything with a bit of grain of salt when I say I'd expected to work with enterprise com companies. But as as is the case often with referral business, I kind of found myself um, working with a lot of financial services companies, small firms, a lot of private equity firms, and ended up having a really nice base of business. Um, and then hit that point that a lot of freelancers get where I was too busy. I either needed to scale and grow a company or I needed to do something else because mm -hmm. I had, you know, it's a good problem to have, yeah. right? But every time you get a client and do their implementation, now you're also their ongoing admin and the work kind of piles up. And, and by the way, that's not that different than some of the problems that admins have in-house when, when their foot, footprint expands. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But Anyway, needless to say, I, I um, decided that I really did miss being on the client side. That's kind of where I'm, I'm most comfortable. I like the, the long-term care and feeding of an org and, and really um, being around for the long haul to, to help an org um, or help a company really figure out how to get the most benefit from the platform. Um, so I, I made my way back to the client side, um, spent some time with actually one of my clients moved me to the wild side and it went work directly for them for a while. Um, then spent four years um, as a, a director and VP level running the Salesforce uh, service cloud and, and uh, sales cloud implementation for a big managed services company. I'm actually on my second tour of duty now at a company called Invitation Home. So I did, I did a stint back when they started. So one of the through lines in, in my history is working for overnight startups. So Invitation Homes, um, which is my current employer, uh, was created in 2013, um, and they buy rental properties, uh, 48,000 in year one. And um, I led the team that stood up that entirely platform as a service org in order to manage all of the details involved with deciding which properties, getting those properties up 
to standard from a rehab perspective, getting them ready to rent. So I was there for a year, stood that up. Um, and then a couple of years ago, um, again, they, they wooed me back to the wild side to really, um, you know, kind of take advantage of the innovation that's occurred on the platform in, in the number of years since we first built that. Um, and that's what I'm doing today. Um, have, have, have an awesome team. I, I just changed my role a little bit. I've been running the team on a day-to-day -day basis um, through some really cool stuff. We did three experience sites. We just did an Einstein intent deployment um, and have just moved into a new role where I'm actually leading the efforts to stand up a Salesforce Center of Excellence there. So whew, well, that was a lot. That's what happens when you've been doing this that long. <laughs> there, there isn't much you <laughs> haven't seen then over the years. It's uh, yeah, quite some journey. And obviously, I know um, obviously you're passionate about the, the admin role. And I guess at times in your career, you've you've kind of performed that function. You've you've performed a range of different roles. But I guess the admin role from when you first got into the ecosystem, um, like you said, when when you were running reports and um, there wasn't an awe um, ability, um, to now, uh, it's obviously changed a lot. And there's been the introduction of some new kind of um, titles along the way. So you've got product owner, platform manager. Like, how have you seen that that function, that responsibility evolve over the years? And um, and what do you make of those different roles? Yeah, it's a really great question. I I think. I would say it's been in the last couple of years, we've really started to see that role change. And, and I believe it, it's happened in conjunction with the complexity of the platform. Um, and, you know, whereas we used to be able to wear multiple hats, we were wearing kind of a business hat and could also manage and run the system. Um, both of those things, right? Certainly the system's getting more complex and even our understanding of roles like RevOps, for instance, are becoming more complex where there's really a need to specialize. So from, from my vantage point, um, what, what I am seeing is um, we're starting to think about supporting our Salesforce teams very similar to any other piece of technology in the tech stack and starting to differentiate the people that are really working with the business and understanding requirements. And, you know, just recently we've, we've rolled out the, the business analyst cert that um, a lot of people have, have already taken advantage of. Um, and that's now a different team often than the teams that, that's doing hands-on mm -hmm. keyboards. And I know that there's probably, you know, people that are going, duh, we've been doing this for years, but I'm willing to say until a couple of years ago in the Salesforce space, Product management, product owner, those were not words that were talked about. Um, and I think the Salesforce community is now just kind of catching up with a lot of things and tactics and approaches and roles that have been part and parcel in traditional um, software development for, for a number of years. And I think it makes sense because we are no longer this very simple platform. We are a very complex piece of the technology stack. Yeah, I agree. I think um, I think there's some misconceptions around what the title means to different companies. And I think like you're right in terms of like the product owner, in my opinion, is more business focused. The platform manager, you know, runs the the, the operational side of, of the platform and potentially might manage admins and um, and obviously admins are, are, are hands on. But but yeah, I think there's, um, you know, every company can be different. And uh, I think there there is some confusion around the, the different titles. But I do think they're more aligning to the, the enterprise technology world, like you mentioned. What, one of the other things that's kind of interesting is historically admins and devs were very different. And, you know, back in the day, if somebody told you that they were both, you were very skeptical. You were probably like, eh, you're probably not self-actualized enough to know that you really probably aren't good at one of those two things. And I know there's unicorns out there, but generally speaking, they did different things and thought about different things. And I think another kind of interesting inflection point where we are right now is our um, declarative automation is getting much more complicated and it's getting much more powerful, which means that a lot of dev concepts that previously admins didn't need to know, right? Before save and after save and, you know, really unit testing, all of this stuff is suddenly something that's bleeding into the admin world. And all of the devs that, you know, their go-to was Apex, their go-to was code. Suddenly it's like, hmm, it might make more sense, and now we have the capability to maybe do this with a declarative tool. So I think flow is a really interesting inflection point. I think the move towards flow as um, eventually the only 
automotive, uh, declarative automation solution is also going to be really interesting to see how it further changes roles um, across the ecosystem. My, my, uh, you heard it here first. I believe there's going to end up being a, a new role called a declarative automation specialist mm-hmm. or something along those lines where it's, um, you know, somebody who's really focused on that and is kind of a specialist that's their niche and, you know, kind of is that Venn diagram between some of the admin functionality and some of the dev functionality. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's just where I'm putting that makes my money. Sense. Yeah. And, and I think because of the, the um, evolution of the platform and the variety of roles now, it is quite difficult for a hiring manager to work out what do they actually need in a team? Um, you know, like, do they need someone that, that is a developer or has um, admin and development skills? Do they just need someone that's very good in front of the business? Like, how do you work out when you're hiring for your teams? How do you work out what you need from, from an admin? Yeah. So, I mean, very hard to answer that with one generalization because it's always so different. So there's just a few things that, that I'd add if I'm talking to somebody who's thinking about what, what they need on their team. And one thing is, do you have somebody who's responsible for the care and feeding of the system? Um, that, that is a role. And it, it, sometimes it's the admin, right? Maybe they actually have a different title. Um, but Somebody needs to understand how it's used and really, you know, what are all the pieces and parts and what are all the things that we need to do to to iterate it? Who are all the users? What are the use cases? And I I think a lot of companies fail to um, or maybe underestimate the the amount of time. And and it's funny. I heard somebody the other day say, like, you have to buy software that, you know, then you have to have all these people to help support it. It's really not that you're supporting the software. It's that you're continuing to ensure that the software aligns with the business needs. And there's not a business that I'm familiar with that isn't changing all the time. And so more often than not, that's what's happening. But otherwise, it's easy for it to get, you know, stale, to die on the vine, for it to start, you know, becoming something that no longer has the value or certainly doesn't have the maximum value that you can. Um, I'm also a big believer that, you know, the, the value that a company gets from the platform is directly tied to the team that they have who can really ensure that you're getting your, your bang for the buck out of it. And certainly that's, you know, kind of the obvious things, whatever it is that you bought it for, making sure that it's meeting those objectives. Um, but I, I'm a big believer that when you, when you buy the platform, there's a whole lot there you can do with it. And um, where there's a lot of opportunity that I don't think companies take advantage of is really leveraging this on-demand database with all of these custom objects to also automate a lot of ancillary processes and decommission rogue spreadsheets. And I'm, I'm pretty sure in this day and age, there's still a whole lot of companies that are running really critical parts of their business in Excel. Um, and so, you know, to me, I think that having somebody at the helm of Salesforce is not only sure it's you know, not only making sure it's safe and secure and meeting the, the core business objectives, but really that you're extending out the value um, in a way that you're really getting your money's worth. I saw that post on LinkedIn as well. It was, uh, it was funny, like trying to say basically, if you have to hire an admin, it's not it's not software as a service. It's uh, yeah, like you, you you shouldn't be doing that. And it's like you know. So many companies out there think like that, though, right? They buy Salesforce and they think it's just plug and play on off they go. And then they get this kind of rude awakening when they realize like, oh, they need to get information out of Salesforce. And, you know, they, there's so much more they can do with it. It's not going to do it itself. Well, and what, what always ceases to or, or never ceases to amaze me is Salesforce is and regardless of what you're using it for, it can solve a lot of problems for you. It can shave a lot of time off a lot of tasks can surface a lot of actionable information. So if you're going to spend the money, and let's face it, it, it's not a light investment to not also invest in a team that can ensure that you are hitting those marks and finding ways to get more value out of it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, 100%. And, and what, what do you see as misconceptions then, um, not, not so much about the platform, but about the role of an admin? Like, do you, do you see that companies completely misunderstand it or, you know, there's just misconceptions even around people that want to do the role? Yeah. So I, I think there's a lot of them. I think one is that, there, that it means one thing. 
right? So the, so the one thing we can all agree on is there is not a one size fits all definition of an admin. Um, and, you know, that's part of the reason lots of people are functional admins, but have different titles for sure. But there is a very, very broad range from, you know, the solo admin um, who's, you know, kind of the jack of all trades or Jill of all trades to, you know, an admin role inside very, very large organizations where the slice of their piece of responsibility may be very, very small. There are admins inside organizations that um, don't have a lot of change. Their system was built way back when. It looks the same way. And granted, we add a few reports here and there. But, you know, the, that is a person that, that hasn't necessarily had to go deep in the bowels of the platform um, versus there's people like, you know, the teams that I've hired where we got a year, we got to start from scratch and build a whole lot of stuff and continue to iterate it. And so, you know, some of those folks maybe haven't worked a lot. But I would put their their experience really understanding how the platform works up to, you know, up against somebody that's got many years of experience. So not one size fits all, um, not something that you can judge solely by years of experience, um, not easy. So I think that's something else that um, I, I love the enthusiasm of everybody that wants to jump into the ecosystem. I mean, trust me, I have tried to talk every friend, relative, Uber driver, you know, anybody I've ever met in the last 20 years. I'm like, why are you doing this? It's the greatest job ever. Um, but it is not an easy job. It's not for the faint of heart, right? I mean, we work our butts off. We have a ton to learn. I mean, I, I laugh all the time and say, I've been doing this literally for 20 years, right? You'd think I'd like be able to coast at this point in my career and like, what? Lightning? Come on. What? Slow? What? Now, now, like, what are you going to do now? Like get rid of my chatter and make me have to like learn Slack? Like, you know, it, it is never ending um, and that has to be okay. And so I, I think that some people think like, hey, this is going to be easy breezy. I contend it's the best job out there. But I, I do always caveat it and say it is, you know, it's people got to know what they're getting into. And you, you touched on like years of experience there. And I think that's really an important. Um, uh, it's a message that I think needs to be shared far and wide. And especially in my role, right, I get companies that will come to me and say, oh, someone has to have five years of experience or, you know, we, they, they you pigeonhole people based on uh, so they're junior because they've got less than two years experience and they're they're mid-level because it's two to five and then it's you know five plus is is senior so you've got 20 years experience where does that put you master like is that expert level is that my team would tell you heck no for the record <laughs> but um but yeah i for think sure. like you know if you look at years of experience as a, as a measurement tool, like you're, you're completely ruling out a lot of people that are fantastic at the job but just haven't been doing it that long. So when you are looking at, you know, what, what has someone done in that years of experience, is, is it the topic of around like, you know, maintaining or building? Like are they the kind of things you are looking at? I think you're exactly right. So I always say that it, there's, there's some imaginary spectrum that at some point I'm going to put on paper and uh, maybe I'm going to license to all you recruiting types. Uh, that is where we could, you know, really understand on, you know, some of those levers, uh, you know, how much, you know, on, on the scale of one to 10, was this a build versus a maintain? On a scale of one to 10, um, were you always building net new stuff or were you also having to go unwind stuff that somebody else built, right? Because that's a special art in and of itself. Um, I mean, I can tell you, so I've, I've built something for this org in a year. I've been trying to clean stuff out of this org for three years and I'm still working on it. I mean, it's a lot harder when you're, you've got live data and live users and um, have to, you know, build on, on something that, that, you know, has a, has a lot of, we always say spaghetti sauce going on in there. Um, I think also it's really important to understand outside of, you know, what somebody's done on the platform itself. What are the other transferable skills they bring to the table? Um, you know, again, I'm, I'm a big proponent that the admin role can be incredibly influential inside an organization. And I want, you know, I want somebody that's, that's comfortable you know, presenting their point of view and asking questions and solving problems and being proactive. And so I'll, I'll tell you one of the things that, that um, I'm always really surprised about when I'm interviewing, because I'm trying to find all these things, right? Because it, it's not just about what somebody's done um, in the platform. But one of the questions that I always ask people, especially those people that 
were in a position where they didn't necessarily have the ability to influence the the work that was done on the platform, right? Because going back to this, some admins, you know, they're architecting stuff and rolling out new stuff and reintroducing service cloud. Some admins, like, they got a job where, you know, maybe they're doing primarily user administration and troubleshooting, and, and that's okay. But one of the questions that I always ask is, you know, if it was up to you and, you know, resources or, you know, is, you know uh, money wasn't an issue, what kinds of things would you have done differently to improve the system or the user experience? Um, and I got to tell you, a lot of times people are a deer in the headlights and don't, I, I don't know. And so just if, if nothing else, if there's aspiring admins out there, or admins that, you know, are looking for new roles, like it's okay if you haven't been in a position to make all of those changes. But, you know, your ideas are currency. Like I want to know how you think and how proactive you are and where you saw opportunities. And, and by the way, I also want to know if you did see opportunities, how did you share those? Did you, did you make a business case? Did you raise those? So, um, so th those are just things that, um, I, I am very interested in because I want people that, um, that are willing to not just accept the status quo, that are thinking about the possibilities on the platform. It's, there, there's so much possibility there that if I can get somebody to marry that with the willingness to really understand what are the issues inside the business and what are the problems we're trying to solve, I mean, it's amazing what we can do. Um, and, and we can figure mm -hmm. out the how by the way. We can figure out the how. Sometimes it's just taking the time to get inspired with the, with the what and the why. So if someone's joining your team, um, or obviously not everyone listening to this will be joining your team, but if someone was and, and, um, and they were looking to, as an admin, set themselves up for success in this role, in this business, like what are some of the key things you think someone can do early in a role that will give them the foundations in that business to yeah. be successful? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, in my book, Spoiler alert, I got a book. Um, in in the, the book that I have, I, there's a chapter of what I call table stakes. And uh, the, the chapter heading is table stakes. Know thy company, know thy peeps, and know thy org, right? So there's a whole lot of things you have to do to be a value add admin. But those things are just core, you know, for the taking. You've got to do it. So, um, you know, there, there's a couple of things I say. One is, for the first 30 days, walk in and spend, I'll, I'll use a Zig Ziglar quote, see the people, see the people, see the people. And then when you're done, go out and see the people, right? So really getting in front of as many users as you can, um, representing each of the different constituencies. So that's the word I use that, you know, whatever, how, however different teams are structured, making sure that you spent time with each of those, um, making sure that you're also spending time with functional leaders. So this is something where oftentimes admins, you know, oh, they're important. They've got big titles. I'm just an admin. Like, heck no, right? Like, you're here to add value. You have expertise. Like, own that and understand the value of your time is as important as their time. And done right, a little investment with you is going to bring tremendous value back to the organization, back to that team, back to that leader. So, um, you know, and, and by the way, in the book, I've got things like questions that you can ask sales leaders or service cloud leaders, or even just general questions for whatever functional leaders you're working with to really dig in and understand uh, how, how you can help, what their objectives are, how they're using the system, how they're not using the system sometimes, right? Um, I also say, have a really open mind during that first 30 days. Um, certainly have some grace in terms of not judging what's in the current org. Um, probably saying that as somebody who's like left a lot of crazy orgs in my wake, but having, you know, remembering that when an org was built 10 years ago, for instance, my org that I came back to, we didn't have flow. We didn't even have process builder. We had workflow and code and nothing in between. So I got a very code heavy org that somebody might come in and say, what were they thinking? And it's always important just to understand, you know, as the system has evolved, um, not, not to have judgment for, for those that made the right decisions at the time. Um, but also one of the things that, that I, I hired somebody last year and I said, the problems that you're seeing on day one and two, because, you know, everybody walks into the org and you look, oh, this, you know, this, and we need this, and we need this. I said, I guarantee you in 30 days, 
you're going to put those on a different place on the priority list once you understand the whole picture of what we're trying to do. doesn't mean that you're not right, that we want those on the list. So first 30 days is really about listening, listening to her, seeing the people, certainly write down the quick hits, write down areas that are more tangly that probably, you know, may warrant some some more complex solutions, um, but really use the time to learn and then validate the assumptions and talk before getting any kind of plan, plan in place. And on the topic of your book, obviously, you, you um, I haven't read it, but I understand some of the things that are in it. And I know you talk about the, the Salesforce conundrum. Now, um, people listening might not know what you mean by that. And when they read the book, they will. But obviously, I haven't yet. So uh, I'd love to understand what you mean by the conundrum. But I, I also understand it's around valuing time, right? And I think, why, why do you feel it's so important that people do put value on their time? Yeah, so thank you for asking. So the Salesforce admin conundrum is a term that I use to describe what I think is a, a very common occurrence for really good Salesforce admins. And that is, the more value you deliver, the busier you get, right? Everybody wants a piece of you. So, you know, you did a knocked out job with, you know, getting the, the sales cloud, you know, stood up or, or maybe you came in after the fact and got it optimized or maybe you brought on this extra team and they're killing it. You've got this automation and now you're using marketing cloud and, you know, what happens? Oh, Suddenly, this team wants a piece of you, right? Maybe, you know, the, the whatever, and, and they're not always even related. It's procurement thought, and they want to see if you can do this. And what, what is very common inside organizations is Salesforce has this land and expand strategy. So they're there, you know, in the wings, like absolutely willing to help and willing to help you make the business case. And uh, your constituents are growing, and yet it's, not uncommon for there to be no additional resources growing proportionately. So you're doing a bang up job. You are adding value left and right. And yet you're overworked. You're tired. You're cranky and feeling overwhelmed. I think I've been there on many occasions. I've witnessed it on my team. I talked to a lot of people in the ecosystem. I think it's very common. Um, and in fact, this is part of the reason that I, I wrote my book is it's really you know, first of all, it's important for me to, to help make sure that people understand, like, what does it mean to add value as a Salesforce admin, right? Um, but equally important, I feel very passionate that if I'm going to teach people how to do that, I darn well better give them the tools to ensure that they can over deliver without overwhelm. So that's actually the, the second part of, of my book. And I think um, like that makes complete sense. And I think especially in this day and age where people are overworked, you know, the, and like you said, um, the, the footprint of Salesforce is expanding in so many companies, but the the investment in staff isn't necessarily. So um, there, there's obviously that angle. But then also in terms of like being an order taker, is that something you talk about in, in the book as well? And because a lot of people don't know how to say no, right? I think that's that's something that we, we learn as recruiters that, you know, some people will take on too much work and, and then get overstressed because of that. But, you know, is that something that, that you think, um, you know, people need to learn and be comfortable with the, the art of saying no? Uh, absolutely. In fact, it's funny, you, you use the word order taker. My, I, my book opens up actually with a cartoon of somebody driving through what I call the McAdman's drive through and somebody's barking orders at them, right? Um, and really the whole premise of the book is how do you learn some techniques and tools to elevate the role of Salesforce admin from order taker to a place where you actually are a value-add business partner where you get a seat at the table, right? Instead of working the window at the McAdman's drive through So heck less. I'm, I'm very big on ensuring, I mean, that, that's really one of the things, right, that differentiates a really good admin is they're the ones that aren't order takers. And so there's a lot in the book and a lot, we talk about a few things here. Um, you know, the, the, the most obvious one, I think, is really making sure you're asking the questions to deliver what somebody really needs instead of what they ask for. Um, that very often those things are very different. I always use the example of how many times I've been asked to build a checkbox. Um, and, you know, when we really dug into the what and what did you need and why and all that stuff, you know, the, the checkbox certainly was was not what we needed. Um, 
So, you know, really being willing to ask those questions um, and, and get to the heart of it. I always say, you know, just like in sales, we say like, you shouldn't be assuming anything. You understand what they're trying to do and why, and what's their timeline and what's driving it and what's the impetus. Those are the same questions. Um, I also say we need to listen, but not too literally, right? So this is another trick for Salesforce admins, especially newer ones. We're, we're so busy listening for those words that we sometimes take things very literally based on the ask. So somebody says, um, I need better visibility into my leads. We go, oh, what? He needs a leads doctor. I got to roll out leads, right? Or um, I remember very well um, an admin that I worked with went deep in the weeds for a day. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, so-and-so said, um, you know, they, they need some help forecasting. And so this person's doing this deep dive to try to learn enterprise forecasting. It was like, whoa, whoa, let's go have a conversation because I'm pretty sure they need to improve the way they are reviewing their forecast. Mm -hmm. And in, in that company, it meant something totally different. It actually happened, had to do with some tweaks they needed in their role hierarchy. Um, but they're just good examples where a lot of times we're listening for words, especially we just learn this stuff and we're eager to deliver notes. Tasks. Those are, those are two other examples that I hear all the time where, you know, somebody says they need tasks and suddenly, you know, activity timelines and hold, hold please. Like, what, what, what is it we're trying to do? So that's, um, you know, a, a second area where I would say making sure that um, that we're, we're not just taking orders. Um, and then also, lastly, being, being willing to present, you know, what isn't what isn't a good use of the platform. Right. And, um, you know, a lot of times that or or is this the right time to be doing something on the platform or is this the right way to approach it? So I'm I'm a big believer that part of the value that good Salesforce admins bring is the discernment to help companies identify what's the right use case, what's the right cadence for rolling stuff out, what's the right way to do it. Sometimes we got to take stuff out of the platform. Right. I mean, might be that. Um, and then I guess, you know, I won't say lastly, because it's probably a topic that I would have a lot of other ideas that, that we could talk through. But I think there's also um, a concept of helping make sure that people understand, um, in particular, your functional leaders, what you already have in the platform and help them connect the dots for how it can solve challenges they have. So what, what I mean by that is there's, you know, um, a lot of information, I would say there's gold in them, our hills, right? There's so much information sitting inside the system. And our job at being proactive is not to just serve up the reports that people are asking for, but looking in there and saying, how come nobody's looking at this? Or did you understand that if we look at this and this and this, it can tell us why this is happening? So being willing to kind of serve up the insight, make sure they know it's there, help them see the so what. And then on top of that, where the real magic happens, help them marry the so what with here's how I can help. Here's how the platform can help, right? So, you know, you've, you've said that you're struggling with your, you know, with your win-loss ratio. Well, let's figure it out. Let's look at some things. Hey, it looks like this, this, this. Based on that, maybe we should, you know, whatever it is, turn on pipeline inspector, roll out contact rolls, like whatever the thing is that's going to solve it. But I think that's really where we stand out and get to step up as value add business partners where we're, we're helping solve challenges and leveraging our knowledge of the platform with our understanding of the business challenges. And that's where the magic happens. See, I, I think that's a really interesting point because um, I think there's another misconception that there's a, a real, um, a very much a difference between an admin role and a functional consultant role, right? And I think actually there isn't that much difference because a good admin is consulting to their business. And I think, um, you know, typically functional consultants historically have been on the Salesforce partner side where they're doing implementations and they're, they're given a problem and they solve it with a solution in Salesforce. And But that's also what an admin's doing, right? So... So actually, there isn't a huge gap and a void between someone that works internally and someone that works externally. That if they're if they're doing the right things, they're consulting as well, and and they can make that transition from being a on the customer side to partner and and vice versa. Because you know ultimately they kind of do the same thing. I would completely agree. A great admin is a functional consultant inside the organization, and and a you know, a, a, um, an expert on the capabilities of the platform. Don't always have to know how to do it all, right? We can always figure that out, but really being able to understand the art of the possible and match what's possible on the platform with the needs of the business. 
Mm-hmm. And my, my next question was going to be around some actionable tips. And I know that last question, we kind of touched on a few different things that around not being an order taker, but then kind of that evolved into some other areas. So if, if they are the tips, then then that's um, that's that's fine. But if there's anything else kind of maybe technical or or just something that you think every admin should be doing in their current organization or um, when they join an organization or even in their career, um, not necessarily in a role right now. Do you have any kind of tips that, that you would want to see everyone doing? Yeah, certainly. I think kind of getting to the heart of what we were just talking about, which is it's, you know, the theme here, the through line is be consultative, right? Um, and, you know, use your questions, do your discovery, listen, marry things up. One of the things I always also tell people is to lead with your point of view. So, you know, this goes back to I'm not just an order taker. I'm, I'm an expert in my field. That's how every admin should feel. And um, really taking the time when we're considering options and when we're presenting options to, to lead with the point of view, not just here's two things, but really I understood what you asked for. Let's, hey, let's validate and make sure that I, that I got it right. I've, I've done the work. Here's my recommendation as to, as to what we should do and why. And I know it's a really, it sounds like a really simple thing, but um, it's something that I know my team, if they're listening, are like, eh, ah, point of view, you know, you tell us this all the time. Um, I, think, I think it's really what, what, you know, again, one of the differentiators, right, between somebody that's just presenting information and somebody that's providing the context around, you know, part of how you got your point of view is sharing the context. The reason I came up with this or, you know, even enough context that somebody can understand pros and cons of a, of a different decision. So, you know, helping somebody, you know, understand that, yes, yeah, Salesforce could do all this stuff and we could, we could automate all of that, but, you know, we can do 90% of that really quickly. And I think you're going to get enough bang for your buck. So my recommendation would be, let's at least start there. How does that sound? I think that gets us faster time to value. Um, so I think really having the confidence to present what your opinion mm-hmm. is, that's what people that's what people want to hear. That's what people need. And I think sometimes admins get intimidated by by titles or by what they feel is their own lack of experience. But really having that that trust in your expertise. And by the way, phone a friend if you if you if you aren't sure before you want to go make that presentation. There's a whole wild world of Ohana out there that that'll be ready to to weigh in. Um, but really making sure that you're, um, you know, again, not just taking orders, but really marrying the needs, the timing, the cost, all of that um, to consider what should or shouldn't be done in, inside an organization. Especially as um, Salesforce salaries are going up so high, right? Like um, they're, they're constantly going up and, and companies, when they're investing in an admin um, or investing in any role, they want an expert. They want someone that, that is going to give that advice. And I think, you know, that's what the company wants to see from from someone. But if someone isn't comfortable doing that it's probably their own reflection on you know where they stand in the the organization rather than it's not not thinking that's what the company want from them because really that's what every company wants right someone to take control to take ownership to guide to 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 provide their their insights so um and and the final um final um question um on your book um so tell me what's it been like writing a book um who's the book for and um and who's it going to really help yeah so I always say 20 years in the making, right? It only took me one pandemic to, to almost get it over the finish line. Uh, so dar- darn close. But it, it, it really, you know, for me, started out as a debrief when I left a job a few years back and um, was sitting down I, really close to the brink of burnout myself, having, you know, just gone through a pretty crazy project without nearly enough resources um, and looking back, reflecting to figure out what, what could I have done different to make it easier for me and my team? Um, what, what could we have stopped doing? What could we have done better? And so that was the genesis of it. But as I started thinking through it, it really also occurred to me that I have a fairly unique vantage point that I've, I've been in this industry for as long as I have. And um, it's given me you know, the luxury of seeing a whole lot of admins along the way, right? So um, I have directly hired and managed several dozen myself. I have, you know, coached and advised and guided in, you know, my roles at Salesforce and as a consultant, you know, probably dozens more. And it's, I, I really started thinking about, you know, what, what is it that makes some okay and some extraordinary? 
And, you know, I've been doing this long enough to, you know, not just because I think that, but I've, you know, seen the, the trajectory of their careers over time. And um, one of the things that, that it occurred to me was, you know, there's a lot of people that really want to walk in and, and do a stellar job and be that extraordinary admin. And they just, they don't know how. And especially a lot of people inside organizations work for people that aren't Salesforce practitioners, right? Especially in organizations where you might be the only Salesforce person. So the the first goal of my book was really to see if I could shorten some learning curves for folks um, that are new or maybe just struggling to figure out, you know, how, how do I get at the, a seat at the table? How do I really advance my career? How do I make it more fun, frankly? Because it's a lot more fun when you're sitting at the table instead of sitting at the McAdams drive through window with everything coming at you. Um, so, so that was really the, the impetus behind it. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you know, as I reflected on, um, you know, some of my own experiences just with, you know, the, the Salesforce admin conundrum and seen a lot of personal heroics from my teams who've delivered fantastic work over the years and sometimes at their own expense, I did feel very strongly that I wanted to provide some very actionable tools and techniques of how do you say no? How do you negotiate trade-offs? How, you know, what are the things that that we're doing where we're culpable for our own busyness. And, and by the way, there's a whole chapter because there's like 10 of them that I've identified that's like, oh, that's on me. Um, so the, the book is really intended to be, it's not necessarily a sit down and read it end to end. It's, you know, pick it up, flip through the headings, figure out what's going down with you right now. You know, for people newer in their career, they're probably going to spend a lot of time really on that front half of the book. And there's there's talk tracks so you can even practice saying some of these things. There's kind of scenarios. There's no hands on keyboards. So for anybody that's thinking they're going to like learn flow and my team right now will be behind me going, yeah, not from Jody. Um, but, you know, that's not what they're going to get out of the book. But it really is intended to help people have very specific ways that they can elevate their role, and do so in a way that they're over-delivering without overwhelm. Amazing. Well, I'm definitely going to pick up a copy when it's available. I think it's coming out early August at this stage. Yes. All, all goes well. Hopefully, it'll, it'll be out by the time um, this, this is live. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to give my shameless plug. People can find more information at SF Admin Book, so Salesforce Admin, sfadminbook.com. Um, and right now, if, in the event it's not out, there's at least a, a landing page. You can get some, some of those questions I talked about, about um, how to really probe for the right solution. Um, but hopefully by then you can click the button. It'll be available on Amazon, paperback, Kindle, and I'm actually working on the audio book right now as well. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed it. And I'm really excited to see the book and, and see the value that people get from that. So I'll, uh, I'll make sure we share those links. And uh, yeah, excited to see uh, the feedback we hear from the market as well. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the opportunity today. Ben. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the chat. And if you did, please make sure you have subscribed for future episodes that are coming through. I would also be very grateful if you would consider leaving a review on your chosen podcast platform as five-star reviews will help us to reach more trailblazers from across the world. I look forward to sharing another episode with you soon and thanks again.